Well, welcome everyone to CBCG's Friday night online fellowship meeting. Uh, we get to do this every Friday night and we have a chance to visit with brethren from around the world and to hear a message from one of God's ministers. And tonight uh, we're going to hear from Tom Fannin. Tom is in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Tom is going to bring us a message entitled, Remember Your Victories. So I introduce to you Tom Fannin. Well, brethren, welcome to another GoTo meeting. It's really good to be with everyone and enjoying the beginning here shortly of the Sabbath where I'm at. So a question for everyone is, do you remember your victories? Do we take time to remember what God and Jesus Christ have done for us in our lives, giving us victories? You know, God wants us to remember our victories and all the things that he's done for us because it helps us to build a relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. So at the start of the message, we're going to talk about uh, the account of King Asa. Back in Second Chronicles, you can start turning there with me. Now, King Asa uh, experienced great victories. And as we'll start this, we'll talk a little bit about his father, King Abijah, which also had a great victory during his reign. Through God, both of them as kings receiving these victories. So turn back with me, if you would, to Second Chronicles, the 13th chapter. And we'll start again by talking about the King Abijah, the father of King Asa. In Second Chronicles 13 and verse 4, it says, and Abijah stood up on Mount uh, Zemarium in the hills of Ephraim and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. So we know that Jeroboam was the king of the northern ten tribes, the, the king of Israel, Abijah, king of Judah. And right away, uh, King Jeroboam, after God had given him the ten tribes, turned away from God and also turned the people away from God by, we know, uh, setting up idols for them to worship by changing days that God appointed to be holy to other days for them to worship. Also, he, he made priests out of men that shouldn't have been priests, not from the tribe of Levi. So Jeroboam did a lot of things immediately when he took over as king. And hey, we see that through history, don't we, in, in Christian churches where the things that Jeroboam did there with um, Israel still continues on today. But let's go ahead and, and pick up in verse 12 now. It says, and this is Abijah speaking here, and says, and behold, God himself is with us as commander and his priests with sounding uh, and his priest was sounding silver trumpets to cry the alarm against you. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. So hey, Abijah is trying to warn Jeroboam and Israel, don't, don't come against God, the God of your fathers. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to come up behind them so that they were in front of Judah and the ambush was behind them. And Judah turned, and behold, the battle was before and behind, and they cried to the Lord, and the priest sounded with the silver trumpets. And the men of Judah shouted, and it came to pass, as the men of Judah shouted, God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people killed them with a great slaughter, and there fell down dead 500,000 chosen men of Israel. So what a great victory that was, and how sad here, kinsmen, these are descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, and here they are fighting against each other. And that day, as it says here, 500,000 chosen men of Israel fell. So a great victory, but very sad that that had to happen. Going on now uh, into verse 18, and it says, And the children of Israel were humbled at that time, and the children of Judah won because they relied upon the Lord of their fathers. And it's something important for us to remember because 
They relied on God. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, and Jeshanon with its villages, and, and Ephron with its villages. And Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. So again, now the question, if you were um, a son of a king or a daughter of a king, and you were from the uh, nation of Judah, would you remember this victory given to your father, given to your country? Well, I, I hope if we were in that position, we would remember such a great victory for a long time. Let's go on to 2 Chronicles 14 and pick it up in verse 1. And it goes on to say here, And Abijah slept with his fathers. And they buried him in the city of David, and his son Asa reigned in his place. And in, in his days, the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. So on down to verse, uh, verse 5, it says, And he also took out of all the cities of Judah and hide, uh, took out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and make walls around them and towers and gates and bars, while the land is still before us, because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. And they built and were blessed. So I think that's a great example of a, of a king there, a, a king that tried to seek God, that tried to follow God and also have the nation follow God. And God gave them rest and peace. And, you know, I think about ourselves. How, how would we be if we were given a period of time, let's say 10 years here, just like Asa got, <clears throat> to have quiet and rest? What would we do with that quiet and rest? Would we go forward and develop ourselves and build spiritual character, uh, sort of what, what Asa did here with the nation? Or would we uh, go backwards and would we forget God in a 10-year stretch of, of peace and quiet in our lives, okay? But we'll see what Asa did with this time and where his mind was. Going down to verse 9. It says, And Zara, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots, and he came to Marshall. So that's, that's quite an army coming at you, isn't it? Think about one million coming towards you. So obviously this was well planned by the Ethiopians and what they were going to do, and maybe they knew that, hey, this is a, a nation that's been at peace and been, been at rest, and this might be a good time to go challenge them, right? Let's continue on in verse 10, and it says, And Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in order in the valley of uh, Zipathoth at Mershaw. And Asa cried to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it's nothing uh, with you to help, whether with many or with uh, him who has no power. Help us. O Lord, our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against the multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. And the Lord struck the Cushites before Asa and before Judah, and the Cushites fled. And Asa and the people with him pursued them to Gerar, and the Cushites fell, for none was left alive of them. Of one million people plus 300 chariots, and it says none were left alive. What a great victory that God gave Judah at that time under the king Asa. For they destroyed them before the Lord and before his army, and they carried away very much spoil. So after this time of peace, um, 
Asa was still in the right mind and the right spirit towards God. And he turned to God when he saw this coming, and God delivered him, gave him and Judah the victory. Well, does this continue? Does Asa continue this, this attitude, this spirit he had about him to seek and search God? We'll go on now to chapter 15 of Second of Second Chronicles, and we'll read just verse 1 and 2. And we won't read all the verses here, but we'll skip through some of the verses into chapters 15 and 16. And it says, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Odid, and he went out to Medes and said to him, Hear me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. And if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Very clear message given to Asa. Did he remember that? Same thing with us. Do we remember these things? Because these very same things can be said of us, right? As long as we're with God, he is with us. Let's go on down to verse 12. And this is speaking of Judah and all those who... Uh, from the tribe of Israel that came, we know, to be with Judah because they knew that God was with Judah and also the Benjamite, Benjamites. And it says here in verse uh, 12, it says, Speaking of all them, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And, what, uh, and whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. So really it's, it's very similar to the covenant we entered into that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But when we, when we entered into this covenant ourselves in baptism, you know, we agreed also that we would seek after God. But here they entered into this covenant, and it says that anyone who did not seek God would be put to death. That was the covenant that they all agreed to. On down to verse 19 then, and it says, There was no war uh, to the 35th year of the reign of Asa. So what a blessing to have that much time again, to have peace, no war in your country, to have blessings. Hopefully, he remembered that, all that time of peace, what God had done for him and his nation. But let's go on to chapter 16 and, and review and find out again if he remembered this or not. Chapter 16, verse 1, and it says, In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, uh, king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah so that he might let no one go out or come in to King uh, Asa, king of Judah. And Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Benadad, king of Syria, who lived at Damascus. And he said here, let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent uh, you silver and gold Go break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he may depart from me. Well, we see what's happening here, don't we? That great victory that was given to Asa, he, he forgot about it. The covenant, he forgot about it. And he took that wealth, the spoil they had received, and gave to someone else for protection, for help. In other words, he didn't go back to God again for help against Basha, the king of Israel. He started to look to someone else for help. Let's go down and we'll finish up the story here and start in verse 7. And it says, At that time Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped out of your hand. He could have had it all. He, he could have turned to God, and he could have had the victory over Israel. He could have had the victory over 
Syria, but that's not what he chose to do. So here's what he was reminded of, okay, by Hanani the seer. In verse 8, he says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with many chariots and horsemen? He's asking them, weren't they a huge army? One million people, 300 chariots? Do you remember that? Do you remember that day and what happened? They were all destroyed. You were victorious. You took all that spoil from them. Do you, do you remember that? Does that come to your mind? Yet because, he, uh, because you relied on the uh, Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro on all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of of those who whose heart is perfect towards him. Well, something had changed there, obviously, in the heart of Asa. That heart and mind he had at that one time, it wasn't there anymore. And in this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. So, brethren, that's one way, if we want peace in our lives, and we want to prosper spiritually, we need to continue to rely on God and go to God. Because if we don't, we see what can happen in our lives. We can forget about God and what he's done for us and then turn out to be in a position like Asa was here. And the rest of the time he was going to be king, he was going to have wars. And we don't want wars in our life, so to speak. And Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, in the prison house, and he was in a rage against him because of this, and Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Again, he, he was a, of a different mind now. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet until his disease was very grievous. Yet in his disease, he did not seek to the Lord, but to the physicians. You know, Asa could have, again, sought the Lord and went to him for healing and went to him for help. And he could have been healed and he could have had more time. But we know where he was at now in his mind. He had left God and he was turning to others. In this case, he was turning to the physicians for healing for his feet, but it wasn't going to work. So we see in verse 13, it says, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the 41st year of his reign. Well, God wants us to remember our victory, so we'll continue to seek him. For deliverance because that's what God desires us to do doesn't he? he God wants us to continually go to him for deliverance and not rely on anyone else having that trust having faith in him because all the things that he's done for us and God wants us to remember those well, let's turn back to first Samuel 17 and we're going to Go over the account of David and Goliath, and we'll we'll see what David did. Was David one that remembered what God did for him? So first, back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17. First Samuel 17, verse 31. And it says, And the words which David spoke were heard, and they were told before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, speaking of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb out of its mouth. 
And when it rose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, may the Lord be with you. So yes, David remembered. David remembered his victories over the bear and over the lion. David remembered both of them. And that gave him the confidence to know that he could also go against this Philistine and take, take care of the Philistine. So God, again, as David remembered, wants us to remember because, you know, in our lives, we come across situations where we have our own bears or have our own, our own lions at times that we, we need to face. Let's go ahead and turn back now to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. In Psalm 54, I'm going to uh, start reading here in verse number 1. It says here, Save me, O God, by your name, and judge me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and cruel men seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. Salah, or think on this. Any you know, in times in our lives, we don't we have people come against us? And I think at times, you know, in our lives, and I'll think of a time in my life where I, uh, where I work, I ran into a situation like that where I was um, in a in an office and I just taken a position there uh, in the company I worked at where I was managing an office and I um, I had worked with a certain GM uh, for years and really liked him and so because of that I was able to get an opportunity again there uh, with the company I'd been at for a long time. And it wasn't soon after I took that position that this, this general manager retired. And soon after that, a, a man, another man came in, and he wasn't like this general manager I really liked. He, he was different. And uh, he, for some reason, he did not care for me. And he made things pretty difficult on me. He was kind of a person that you would say maybe is a, a reviler and also a type of person that um, you know brings accusations against people and and uh, is, is very demeaning and so this went on for several years and not only him with also with another person that reported to him and I know many times I I cried out to God God please uh, help me with this because at, at times it felt like you know it was more more than uh, you know, I could, I could handle, and we know God says he won't give us more than we can handle, but, you know, it, it made things very difficult on me for, for several years. And again, I cried out to God for help. Well, help came. And one time, um, I got a phone call, and uh, our office got pulled together. And this man I'm telling you about, this general manager, he got relieved of his duties because he really wasn't doing a good job and I wasn't the only one that was being treated this way. He was basically running a whole division um, in an inappropriate way. And the other person I mentioned, well, he was caught up in a lot of things that he shouldn't have been involved in, I'll say. And this was brought to light too. And he was also removed from his position. So God gave me, you might say, deliverance from from two people, okay? So I think about that from time to time, and, and you know, when I run into situations now, maybe where I think about my job and, and people I'm working with or working for, maybe you have a bad day, I reflect 
back on that victory that God gave me in removing two people that were against me and putting me in a better position. And at that time, too, it helped me to reflect on where was I spiritually and was I doing some of the things that I needed to be doing. But it's a lesson for me, a lesson for all of us, that God gives us the victories, and sometimes we are challenged, even by people. Let's go on to verse 4. It says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is, those, uh, is with those who uphold my soul. He shall reward evil to my enemies. Destroy them in your faithfulness. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eyes have seen its desire on my enemies. So again, God delivers us from all troubles, doesn't he? And as we're talking about here, he wants us to go back and remember. Remember those things. Well, in this spiritual walk we're on, uh, we're, we're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. We're going to have difficulties, aren't we? And that's, that's talked about, and we'll, we'll read about that back in 1 Peter. To turn back with me now to 1 Peter, the first chapter. 1 Peter 1, in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading, reserved uh, in heaven for us. And that's what we're all looking forward to, aren't we, is that time. Our calling and being in the kingdom of God is, is first fruits. It goes on to say here, it says, who are being safeguarded by the power of God through faith. And that's something we always need to remember, that God is safeguarding us. He's taking care of us continually through his power. For salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you yourselves greatly rejoice through for the present time. It says if it's necessary. If it's necessary. Sometimes it is necessary for our growth and development to have trials and to have difficulties and to have problems and to have tests because of what they do for us. So if it's necessary and sometimes it is necessary. You are in distress for a little while by various trials, in order that the proving of your faith, which is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is being tested by fire, may be found into praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Christ. So yes, we're gonna we're gonna have trials and tests come up on us. We're gonna have times like what Asa went through when a uh, seemingly a million man armies marching towards us, right? That's going to happen, but we know why those things happen. It's for our testing, right? Well, again, we'll go back to victories here because the message is about, do you remember your victories? Can you look at a time in your life where God has intervened in your life and delivered you? Now, what are victories? What are the victories that God gives all of us? Do we think about what they all are? Healings in our life. Have you had healings? Have you had protection in your life? Special intervention, just when you needed it. All kinds of helps and blessings. You know, blessings are victories. If you look at them the proper way, they're victories. And we all have a lot of different blessings, don't we? Could be, again, health. It could be uh, a good spouse, a good husband, a good wife. It could be uh, a, a really good family that you're a part of, children, grandchildren, whatever it may be. Uh, the people God has surrounded you with. We can look at all of these that are as being victories for us from God, things that God gives us. 
Well, we know the Apostle Paul, he was delivered many times, wasn't he? And he remembered, Paul remembered his deliverances. And he also shared them, and he also encouraged others with him. And you can read back in, uh, there in 2 Corinthians 11, and Paul talks about all the things he went through, and he certainly went through a lot. I know I, I wouldn't want to go through what Paul did as part of his ministry to the Gentiles to serve God's people. Let's go back to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and we'll just review some things that Paul said. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Let's go back there. And we know Paul, Paul was an encourager. And whether he was working with Timothy or whether he was working with with Titus, Paul, Paul did what he could to help them and instruct them. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. It says, here, Paul speaking to Timothy, it says, But you have closely followed my doctrine, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, and in Lystra, you know what sort of persecutions I endured, and the Lord delivered me out of them all. And indeed, everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. So Paul reminds Timothy here that, you know, all these the things he went through, particularly here, that God delivered him. And Timothy may have remembered that. If you read back in Acts 14 of this account where Paul was uh, stoned and left for dead, yeah, Timothy may have been there to witness that, but certainly he was very aware of it, as Paul says here. But again, Paul makes it clear that God delivered him. While we're in 2 Timothy, let's go over the uh, chapter 4 and verse 16 and continue the thought here of what Paul says. 2 Timothy 4:16. He says, during my first offense, he said, no one stood with me. Everyone deserted me. I pray that God will not lay it to their charge. And sometimes we probably feel that way, don't we? That we are uh, on our own, so to speak, that we feel deserted. But we always need to remember that God and Jesus Christ are continually with us, right? So even though we feel like maybe no one's standing with us or we've been deserted, God and Christ are always with us. Paul says that here in 17, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the pro proclamation might be fully made and all the Gentiles might hear the gospel. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. And the Lord will deliver me from every wicked deed and will preserve me for his heavenly kingdom to whom the glory be to the ages of eternity. Amen. And God will deliver us from every wicked deed. And you know, sometimes that may mean a deliverance may mean death for us. But death is also a deliverance, isn't it? We're delivered finally from this world. And from what we go through in this physical body, because we know, as we read back there in Peter, what we have to look forward to, the kingdom. So yes, that is a deliverance also, but in all ways, God will deliver us. Well, I said earlier we'd talk about the baptism covenant, and isn't that a great victory? Let's read about death and life in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn back there. 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to uh, go to verse 55. It says then, O death, where is your sting? And O grave, where is your victory? 
Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the victory that we need to remember because all of us who are in covenant have overcome this. The penalty against us, sin and, and death, we've overcame that through Christ. And as long as we remain faithful, the sting of death, we don't have to worry about that because we'll have life through Christ. This is a great victory that all of us under covenant have experienced. Let's go to Romans 6. And again, this victory is through Christ. And this victory is through God. Romans 6. And let's just read in Romans 6, verse, verse 10. It says, for when he died, speaking of Christ, he died unto sin once for all. And that's something we always need to remember is Christ died one time. That, that'll be it. He just dies one time for all. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. In the same way also, you should indeed reckon yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord. And yes, we are now, all of us, alive to God. We live our lives to God. We live in newness of life. After we came out of the watery grave, that was an expectation. Part of the victory for us. Let's read a little bit about what we've been rescued from. And it's a very great thing. Back in Colossians, see what's written there. In Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 12, it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified for the share of the inheritance of the saints in the light, who has personally rescued us from the power of darkness. Now just think about that for a moment. We have been personally rescued from the power of darkness. Well, what is the power of darkness? Well, we've been rescued from Satan, and from the demons, and from this corrupt world that we were born into. That Satan, who is called the God of this world, is in control over and wants to totally destroy. God personally rescued us from that. How powerful a victory is that for us to be personally rescued there? And you think about Asa, you think about the victory he had over, again, a million people. But put that in to comparison of what we've been personally rescued from when you think about Satan and the demons in this world that God has brought us out of and rescued us from. Well, I think what we've been rescued from is even much, much greater in comparison to what Asa was. Who has personally rescued us from the power of darkness and has transformed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through his own blood, even the remission of sins. Death. The penalty of death. What we need to remember. While we're in Colossians, let's go back to second, uh, the second chapter of Colossians and, and start down in verse 12. While we're still on this thought of baptism, it says, and having been buried with him in baptism, by which you have all, uh, by which you have also been raised with him, through the inner working of God, who raised him from the dead. So yes, we were raised out of that watery grave, weren't we? In that covenant death, to walk in newness of life. For you were once dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but he has now made a lot. He has now made alive with him having forgiven all your trespasses, 
He has blotted out the note of debt against us with the decrees of our sins upon, we know, repentance on our part, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. So our sins died with him, again, upon our repentance and entering into this covenant, and those sins were forgotten. But verse 15 is very powerful for us to remember. It says, after stripping the principalities and the powers, he made a public spectacle of them and has triumphed over them in it. So the day that Christ died that, during that crucifixion, he stripped Satan and the demons and the powers of this world of what they had. And he made a spectacle of them. And he fulfilled his promise. The God of the Old Testament, who became flesh and died for sin that day, he triumphed over all of that for us. What a great victory that day, the day of the crucifixion that occurred for again for us, for what happened here on earth and also in heaven. So again, we need to remember that because there is consequences for not remembering this particular victory in our lives. Let's visit that, the consequence in Hebrews 10. If you'll go back to Hebrews 10 with me. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. It says, therefore, if we willfully go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth. So that is, we've received the knowledge of the truth, and we understand the knowledge of the truth, what it is, what's been done, God's plan and purpose through Jesus Christ. We have an understanding of that truth, that knowledge. It says there is no longer any sacrifice uh, sacrifice for sins because we read back there um, in Romans 6 you know Jesus Christ died once for all one time it says but a terrifying expectation of inevitable judgment and a fierce fire which will devour the adversaries of God consider this anyone who rejects the law of Moses dies without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses how much more punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified? Again, these are the ones who have entered into covenant and they're sanctified through Jesus Christ. And it's trampled underfoot, that sacrifice, what's been done. Again, with which he has been, uh, he was sacrificed as an unholy thing and has scorned the spirit of grace. For we know him who has said, vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So once we enter into covenant, and we've been given this, this victory again, as long as we remain faithful to the end, God and Christ expect us to be faithful to that and to continue from that point to seek them and to go to them. Not forget like Asa did, but to continue to look to them for the victories, for the help, for the deliverance until the end. And that's why Christ tells us each year to keep the Passover. And has he instituted a new, the new covenant Passover with uh, the disciples or the apostles? Has he introduced the wine? Has he introduced the bread? He told them, he said, you take, take of these, but do this in remembrance of me. And so, yes, God and Christ, they want us to remember what's been done, that victory. Well, Christ and God, they are the ones who deliver us, right? They give us the victories. As we've already said, we need to continue to look to them for this. 
Let's go back and read a few more verses in Psalms. Psalms uh, 34. Let's go back to Psalms. In Psalm 34, we'll, we'll just start with verse 6. It says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard, and saved him out of his troubles. And so, you know, God expects us to be of a poor, contrite spirit, doesn't he? And we know God doesn't call the highborn of this world. But he calls people like us, the lowborn, the poor, you might say. But as we cry out to God, God saves us out of our troubles. Verse 17, the righteous cry. The righteous cry out, right? And we know because of Christ and our faith, in his sacrifice and our in our faith in God, we have imputed righteousness. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them again out of all their troubles. Right? Out of all troubles. And then it's repeated again here in verse 19. It says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And certainly I know a lot of people in the church of God over the years, and, and, and right now we see people with a lot of different afflictions and problems, health problems, family problems, job problems, whatever it may be, even problems within the churches. But God delivers us out of all troubles, all problems. So it's good to take time just to think about our victories and all the things, again, God's done. You know, it's good to take time to, when we read God's Word and read through all the examples in God's Word of all the people God's helped down through, through time. Starting, you know, starting back with you know, Abraham and even before Abraham with Noah and all the things God has done for all the patriarchs and prophets and the kings down through Christ and the apostles and in the New Testament church and all the things that were done for his people and God's word and read about that and reflect on that and look at those things that God's done for them and Look at what God does for us. The very same thing. <clears throat> Pray about these things. And ask God to bring these things to our memory. You know, it's, it isn't it easy for us to forget all the things that God has done for us over the years. And it's so easy for us to kind of go back and maybe complain at times and, and look at some of our situations and problems. But we need to take time to remember, again, all the victories we have. And maybe it's good for us to pray to God that God will help us to remember all the things that he's done for us, all the victories he's given us. And bring those back to our minds. So, again, we can thank him and praise him for those things that's been done for us. Let's go back to 1 Samuel. And we'll, we'll go ahead and, and read a few verses here in 1 Samuel, and we'll, we'll start wrapping it up. So I want to go back to 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter. Now, we all have people in the Bible that maybe we, we enjoy reading about and studying about because they inspire us what they did, what God did through them. And I, I enjoy reading about Samuel because Samuel was, <clears throat> he was given to God when he was young, wasn't he, from his mother Hannah and promised to God. God opened her womb up and she had a son and she promised him to God. And he was with God from the time he was small. And God worked with him and God used him. And even when he was 
young, it says he had favor with God and favor with men. He grew in favor with God and men, just like Jesus Christ, right? And Samuel was faithful his whole life to God. And he was faithful to Israel also, the nation of God. So I, I enjoy all those things about Samuel and reading about Samuel and what he did as a personal example for me. Now, 1 Samuel 12, let's go there and pick it up in verse 19. And it says, and all the people said to Samuel, now that they had asked for a king, and they, they got a king, King Saul. Okay? It says, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God, so that we will not die. For we have added evil to all our sins to ask a king for us. So what we're about to read down through here, there's a lot of different lessons we can learn from this. So Samuel spoke back to the people. He said, and Samuel said to the people, do not fear. Okay? Well, they had done something here they hadn't done. They shouldn't have done. Samuel starts off, he says, don't, don't fear. But then he says, you have done all this wickedness. So yeah, Samuel confirms. They, they said they had done evil. And Samuel confirmed it. Yes, you have done this wickedness. You, you did it. Okay? Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. He could have said a lot of things. He started out with don't fear. Yeah, you've done wickedly. But again, Samuel was right with God. And Samuel had the right spirit within him the mind of God and the mind of Christ. He said, don't turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside to go after vanities, which can't profit nor deliver, for they are vain. And that's true for us today. As Samuel gave this message, you know, going after a king, wanting a king, that's vanities. Those are vain. They had God to lead them, to guide them, to deliver them. But they wanted to go after the vanities and be like other nations. We have to be careful ourselves, as Samuel instructed them. We don't want to go after vanities. And there's a lot of vanities in the churches of God. We need to be on guard for that. But we don't want to go after vanities. Verse 22, it says, And the Lord will not forsake you, or not forsake his people, for his great name's sakes, because it pleased the Lord to make you his people. And it's pleased God to have a calling for us too, hasn't it? And for us to answer that calling and be in covenant with God and qualified to be first fruits in the kingdom. If that pleases God, we are now his people. We know for Abraham's seed, then we're Christ's. Also then, I, far it be from me that I should sin against the Lord from ceasing to pray for you. What a great attitude from Samuel here. You know, he didn't want to sin against God. He wanted to continue to pray for them. It says, but I will teach you the good and the right way. So even though they had done all these things, Samuel still desire that they turn to God, that they remember God, that they, that he prayed for them, that he would continue to teach them and help them in any way he could. But here again, he gives the final message here in verse 24. He says, again, I, but I will teach you the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. It says, for consider what great things he has done for you. So we'll close, we'll close with those words. Consider, as Samuel said, what great things he has done for you. So brethren, 
remember your victories.